these tensions, especially for someone who's deeply belonged to a community, are going to be difficult. And it's very easy to make the fight be within the marriage and to use the idea of God to pressure that fight to win or to prevail, as opposed to using the idea of God to challenge ourselves. When we use religion to prevail, it's always evil, in my opinion. When we use our faith to become more refined, loving human beings, we are using our faith appropriately. In this episode of the Hope to Recharge podcast, we welcome Dr. Jennifer van Leysen Fife, an LDS relationship and sexuality coach with a PhD in counseling psychology who helps individuals and couples achieve greater satisfaction and passion in their emotional and sexual relationships. She teaches online courses and offers live retreats to foster self and sexual development, happier intimate relationships, and happier individuals. She is also the host of Room for Two, a popular sex and intimacy coaching podcast. This episode discusses how how to maintain balance while authentically living with one's beliefs, while integrating spousal, community, and religious beliefs, and striving for growth, yet leaving room for questioning practice, God, and our own truths. We also discuss the roles of personal and couples' sexuality and its demands, while not losing our own identity in the name of religion. And now, your host for the Hope to Recharge podcast, Matana. I am so grateful for Dr. Jennifer for joining me here. I've been following you for a long time. I'm probably the only Jewish woman in her Mormon group, I think, maybe not. Probably, probably not, because people follow me from different faiths, but yeah, yeah you would yeah. be a minority. I found Dr. Jennifer's podcast a while back, and then I've been following her Facebook community. I think it's 22,000 people. Yeah. And I'm really observing because I don't know how to respond because the questions that come up there, I understand the pain, but I don't understand what they're asking. Uh. But at the same time, I can relate as a Orthodox Jew to the pain part of yes. the question. So yes. I asked you to come on because I'm doing this five to six weeks series on relationship, marriage, divorce, intimacy. A lot of our audience is Orthodox Jewish, usually women. And I'm finding the more and more I speak to couples in mm -hmm. the religious umbrellas, if it's Muslim, mm -hmm. Jewish, Mormon, any Christian, there's the same pain and the same struggle. And I, yeah. I speak to a lot of Jewish therapists, but I wanted to get the perspective of someone from a different religion, the sure. Mormon religion. And I love your podcast. I could just listen to it because there's so much empathy, so much connection and love in your words. Mm. And you bring comfort. Whatever mm. you say, you just bring comfort. It's mm. very inspiring. There's different conversations there, whether it's religion mm. or not religion. There's a lot of desire to understand the human dynamics and to understand how we can cultivate healthy, good relationships, no mm. matter if you're religious or not. I'm grateful for you that you gave that was on such a short notice and that you're here with me. My, my pleasure. Honestly, it, it'll be fun. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. And I was always called the controversial girl, the controversial mm. girl. Until I was 18, I was quiet with my controversy. Mm. But from 18, I started speaking, asking out loud, and I still don't have a lot of answers. But I, I, I decided that I'm no longer going to sit in the silence of the confusion. I'm going to ask. And I'm going to try to learn and understand. One of the things that I wanted to discuss with you today was within relationships, when we bring God into the relationship, if we're God-fearing humans and we're a part of a religion or a tradition, mm. a lot of times we find that we lose ourselves mm. and our true voice in the name of religion. And then there could be a conflict in the yeah. relationship. Yes. And a lot of Latter-day Saints are experiencing this very phenomenon because with the internet and deeper access to information and to other like-minded people, what used to be a more insular community has become much more exposed. And with that, there has been much more within marriages, a split where one stops believing one is more orthodox, or there's at least enough variation that it creates stress around who are we as a couple, oftentimes because people got married under the idea that we believe the same things and that gives us common ground. And when that gets challenged, it can be very stressful for the marriage and for this sense of identity and place and purpose within each individual. Yes. So yeah, I think that I have a long answer to this. I'm not sure how much you want me to say, but I think that I remember sitting in a class and the professor, I can't remember what this class was, but was talking about religion in terms of how conservative or liberal it was or how much the faith demanded of people. And so, of course, Orthodox Judaism would be far right on the conservative. Jehovah Witness would be far right. Mormonism was a step 
under that, but still high demands of the community. When you get down to something more, I'm trying to think, I can't say the name right now, like universalist Unitarian is a very liberal, meaning it doesn't demand a lot of the people. When you come from more orthodoxy and your behavior is really wrapped around your identity, the upside of that is it drives a high sense of connection with that community because you do the same things. You live out your faith through your behaviors, through your rituals. The upside of it is a strong sense of connection, a strong sense of identity, a strong sense of purpose. The challenging side of it is it's more difficult to feel like your ideas can expand beyond that community without fearing that you'll lose your community yes. and lose your identity. Yes. And so how do we find belonging when we don't feel belonging, but we don't want to lose the belonging? Exactly. And that's what you were talking about. As a child, you had dissent, but you were keeping quiet about it. I did much of that myself. It's like kind of holding, wait a minute, that doesn't feel right to me, but I don't want to lose the group that is my family that I belong to. So how do I belong to my group and my integrity? Yeah. And I think the more orthodox or demanding the community, the more that question can really challenge one's sense of self. And this is genuinely me not dissing Orthodox communities, because I actually think human beings, especially early in development, really benefit from discipline, from structure, because the ego needs it for its development. It needs expectations. It needs you can and you cannot boundaries, because one can thrive within that. But I think also the more if one stays rigid for life, then it really costs one's development. So this is my long-winded way of saying there's a fundamental tension between belonging to our identity, to the structure that has supported us and internalizing and transcending it and progressing beyond it. Because what I say is there's a tension, we're ambivalent about it. A lot of people in their marriages, from a Latter-day Saint point of view, anyway, people that I work with, there's one that tends to hold the anchors. Let's, we need to do this on Sundays. We can't do this. They're holding that And the other person can tend to be more liberal or progressive or challenging. But part of the reason they each take polarized positions is there's an internal ambivalence about, I don't want to really let go of my faith or my community, but I don't want to feel controlled. And that ambivalence often gets played out within the couple. Yes. That makes sense. So we do that as couples, like we will disown parts of ourselves and take a position that's more polarized because we know our spouse will take the other one. Mm. Then you duke it out with each other rather than within yourself. Yes. Yes. And so this happens, these tensions, especially for someone who's deeply belonged to a community are going to be difficult. And it's very easy to make the fight be within the marriage and to use the idea of God to pressure that fight. Meaning I, I sometimes say you don't serve God, God serves you. That is when we're immature, we'll use the idea of God to win or to prevail, as opposed to using the idea of God to challenge ourselves. Mm. When we use religion to prevail, it's always evil, in my opinion. When we use our faith to become more refined, loving human beings, then we are using our faith appropriately. Wow. That's so beautiful. But yet it's very hard because no one teaches us growing up how to do it properly. So give me a little bit of a background that the audience just understands where you grew up and how you got into the field of intimacy in general and how you made the shift between very religious to more of the modern quote unquote. My parents grew up in the Intermountain West as Latter-day Saints. And then my dad took a job as a professor at the University of Vermont. So I was born in Vermont, which is culturally very different from Utah. But my parents were very immersed in our faith, as was I. So that is my dad was, there's a lay leadership. And so my dad was very involved and my mom in leadership positions. So I grew up with my family, my extended family, so to speak, being the Latter-day Saint community. And so these were my people, my friends, my safety, my my social network within a larger context of liberal Vermont. Okay. So it was like I was living in two worlds at once, which was very good for me because I became literate in both realities. And I could see the strengths of my faith community and the weaknesses of the external community. But the opposite was also true. I could see the strengths of my the larger community and some of the liabilities within my Latter-day Saint faith. But my first love was my faith community. For sure. It still is actually. And so many good people there, but I could also see and feel a lot of the pain 
because I cared about them. Mm -hmm. And because I was a perceptive child, I could see we would on the one hand extol and talk about the virtues of marriage and family life and womanhood and motherhood. And, but I could see a lot of women who seemed somewhat trapped and trapped is a little condescending. I don't mean it quite like that, but they were trying so hard to do what they believe God was asking of them, but their lives were surrendered to their husband's desires, their right. husband's career. And so they were earnest, but often seemed depressed to me. Yes. Like they didn't really have equal say in their marriages. Actually, a lot of that was considered the right way, especially when right. I was growing up. And so I cared about, and I think I could see it in my parents' marriage, that dynamic. And I cared about helping. Uh, first of all, I cared about not becoming that woman. Right. As secondarily, I cared about helping LDS women. As a child, similarly, like I was always in this duality where I would want to trust what I was being told, but I would find myself questioning it. And that scared me, my questions, because I didn't want to lose my community, but I also didn't want to live in a trapped way. And I also wanted to live truthfully. Like one right. of a Latter-day Saint kind of adage is that the truth is a Christian one. The truth sets you free, but also that you should do what is right. And the consequence follows. That's to say that it's really important to live with integrity. So there was a tension between complete compliance and integrity for me mm. in my own kind of struggle with God was coming to terms with the fact that I believed in a God who expected me to have integrity more than just comply. So that mm. internal permission allowed me to let myself think what I thought without trying to suppress my thoughts to belong. Wow. And so that with time, as I became a young adult and was going to college in the Latter-day Saint thinking at the time was women should get married and education is a secondary goal, only if you don't get married. So I made sure I didn't get married. Oh, wow. And pursued my education. And once I started my doctorate degree, I met my husband and we got married a few years later. And that was, I had enough self at that point to choose well and to choose a real partner, but I was unusually old for Latter-day Saint terms, right. I was almost 30 and so on. But my larger point here is that I knew that I wanted to be stay in my faith community, but do it with integrity and do it in a way that perhaps could help others. And that really defined my path and my work. And so what I do now is well, I wrote my dissertation on LDS women and sexual agency. And I was really looking at the cultural pressures for women's sexuality to be there for men's sexuality, not that women are sexual beings in their own. And so I was really looking at Latter-day Saint women that had grown up in the faith and were now married and what was their journey into marriage and who were the women that thrived and were comfortable with their sexuality. They were a minority, but there were those women there and how had they related to theology and these ideas. And then there was the women who didn't do well and why didn't they? So that really was research that defined the work that, you know, so I teach online courses for Latter-day Saint women and men and couples around sexuality, around marriages thriving, around how to create more emotional and sexual intimacy out of the basic assumption that one must operate as equals, but one must also operate out of a place of integrity, not just external validation through compliance or through trying to be what others want us to be. That's a good place to start, but not a good place to end if you want to be capable of intimacy, but also a sense of internal freedom. Yeah. I think your following is just a proof of how the world needs it and how they're craving it because it's just more and more people are like, okay, tell me more. Here's my questions. And the questions that are coming up are really good questions. Do you sometimes feel stuck? Do you wish you can be somewhere else? Do you have a vision of where you want to get to, but you just don't know what the first step to take in order to get to that life that you're dreaming of? How did I shift from deep depression, from extreme anxiety to a thriving life, to a productive life, to a life full of joy? I put many things into practice and it's every single day. Many of you know that it's gratitude, a healthy mindset, boundaries, self-love, and one of the most important things that many people don't speak about self-forgiveness and forgiveness to others essential for healing if you want to work one-on-one -on -one with me on these topics in order to move forward towards that dream life that you have a vision of click the link below in the show notes it's a custom made program for you one-on-one -on -one with me we will develop a concrete program that you can implement in your life so you can create a better well-being click the link below looking forward to working with you so many questions are, I've been holding this for 15 years and I'm finally yes. ready to ask, or 
I'm married for 25 years and I always felt da, 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 and now I'm done. I'm ready to live a truth. There's a lot of, I feel like, okay, I'm done with this fitting into the box. I need a little bit more because I'm feeling dead, even though I'm following the path that I was yes, raised with. Exactly. And I want to live. I'm not feeling that I'm living a life. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Because I think again, in the beginning that can actually help us live structures. That was helpful for me to have a sense of this is okay. This is not okay. You have a God that cares about you. No, those were very helpful psychologically early on in life, but there's a point at which it no longer is helpful. It becomes constraining it. You need to expand the container of your mind. And if you're too afraid of that growth process, that's inherent to spiritual development, inherent right. to becoming a more godly person, you basically will use the faith structure to not grow. You need the faith structure to relate to it in a way that allows you to keep growing. Yeah. And you said it so well in the beginning that a lot of times we lose ourselves in order to stay in the community and not lose the community. And I speak to so many people in our community, so many people, and their last word is, what am I supposed to do? I have kids. I have yeah. family. If no, I do fun. anything, to, they won't take my kids to school. They, they I, We won't be able to marry or them off. It got yes. a little bit better. I would say a little bit more open-minded, a little bit more accepting, not so much in Israel, but in America, yes, and around the world. And Israel is still very much, you have to stay within the cubicle that you are set to be. Yes. And, and, and we're not taught to really expand your mind and think differently. And welcome the thought differently on yes. what's coming up. And what I find that comes up in marriage is like you said, so we're basically committed to the same path of religion. These are the rules. Then you go into marriage, not even knowing what to expect. And then things start surfacing and you're like, wait, mm. I know that this is the right way, but it doesn't feel good. What do yeah. I do? What do I right. do? And, exactly. And a lot of people, especially women are afraid to even say it out loud until they either mental illness breaks apart or yes. like uh, just there's an awakening that yes. happens if either it's physical or mental or whatever that just says you know what we have to connect to ourselves and what's really going on and the thing that i keep on i say you cannot live a godly life based on what god said if you're feeling dead inside that's not godly god doesn't exactly. want that if you're feeling dead inside you're not living in the name of yes. god and you're feeling not alive and connected Absolutely. you have to feel connected that's yes. godly. And a yes. lot of times we lose that because we don't have the language, because we don't have the comfort to discuss what comes up that's non-traditional. That's right. Because fear takes over. And when fear leads us, then it does suffocate. Now, I want to say that somewhat humbly, because when you live in a community and a society in which the cost of your individuality is so high, or it's going to cost your children or cost your, your belonging, although you're often up against very hard choices and they're real. And a lot of people learn how to dissent internally while behaviorally going along in order to have the advantages of that society while trying to hold on to something within themselves. But when it really can be costly is in the sense that you're talking about that I just have to imagine that I am wrong. That's what a lot of us do. Rather than let myself know what I know or think what I think, I have to turn it into I'm broken, defective, wrong because I don't feel alive, mm -hmm. because something here is not working for me. Rather then maybe I'm not wrong. Maybe there's something here I need to listen to. And people in a marriages where somebody kind of prevails over them, that's often what they're doing is they're doubting themselves because they're afraid to know what they know. They're mm -hmm. afraid of their own strength. They're afraid of their own capacity to see. Mm -hmm. And so they prefer the confusion and the, having the belonging stay intact, but they suppress something very powerful within themselves and very important. It's very human. It's understandable. But yes, I fully agree with the idea that it's not godly because to live in a godly way, your soul expands. You yeah. become more capable of love. You become more capable of self-acceptance and acceptance of others. And yet it takes a lot of courage. And for some more than others, depending on what the cost would be for living true to your integrity. There's a Hebrew book that came out by an Israeli therapist, but she got her doctorate in intimacy. And she wrote a book and it's called in Hebrew, Pashut Liltot, Simply Want, to simply want. She grew up religious, but she also took in general what the cultural world is telling mm. women how to show yeah. up sexually. Yeah. And she's saying, let's change the conversation instead of how do we keep the marriage alive and well, that what is my job as a woman? Mm. Do we get the woman to be a partner of a desire and mm. not only 
Yes. As an act of service. I'm not just an act of service. I'm a human. I'm I'm a person. I'm right. I'm sexual too. I want it. How do we shift that understanding and how do we show up properly? And it it was such an incredible book that everybody Mm. got all the way, religious or not religious, started talking Mm. about it because, wait, I'm not only an act of service in order to keep the man happy and the family happy and the structure together. You mean I have a desire? I'm allowed to have the desire also? Yeah. And I'm allowed to say no and not get the consequence by what will happen. That's very much what the the online course I do, The Art of Desire, is about talking to Latter-day Saint women about how they've been. I start with kind of how have we been socialized? What are the messages we've learned about what it is to be a woman and what it is to be sexual? For much like this book, for Latter-day Saint women, it's like my sexuality exists to prop up the man to manage his sexual needs. It's my sexuality is understood in reference to men's sexuality. And so it's not at all surprising in my view that when women get married, because they've not been taught to desire or honor their desires. In fact, many have been taught to suppress their desires in order to be good. And so that's why the course is called the art of desire. Like why does desire matter? Because it's so central to personhood. It's so central to thriving, to being an equal, to having your own mind. And when we've been taught that to be good is to fold into another person's mind or to live out other people's lives, we are dead inside and resentful often, depressed often. Desire, where's that going to come from? I don't even have a self to share. I can only do it compliantly. And then women get often then pathologized for it. Even though they're doing exactly what the culture dictates, then they get told you're broken in some way because you don't desire your husband. Then women often take that on themselves. Like I'm even, I'm terrible because I don't feel excited to be with him sexually. And yet there's no basis on which they could because they haven't yet been allowed within themselves or within the culture to be a full partner, thriving individual that has her own sexuality and can choose to share it. We're, that's really what partnership requires, but we're afraid of it. We've been very good traditionally, not just Latter-day Saints, in all cultures, at controlling and subjugating women as a way for men to feel on top. But very strong men don't need to subjugate anyone to feel strong. And so how do we redefine what it is to really be partnered, not this kind of validation dependent system where men are looking to women to validate their sexuality, women are looking to men to validate validate that they're okay through subjugating their sexuality, those maybe create a kind of ideal marriage in a cultural sense, like that the community accepts that version, but not happiness and intimacy in a marriage, which our souls really long for, but often we don't know how to create it. So where's the beginning of it? Like, where did we go wrong? Where do you think the beginning of the, of what you're trying to fix and what Michali's yeah. trying to fix and other, like the right. world is waking up now. Where did we go wrong? I think well, where, Esther Perel also talks about it, know, right? Yeah, yeah, prob- I'm trying to think about how she talks. About, she does talk about so much of this kind of thing, but one of the ways we go wrong is we mistake the container for life. The point of the rules in Christian thinking is to love, to love what is good. So you use the structure to facilitate that, but don't do it the other way around. That's hypocrisy. That's very human, but it will damn us. It will keep us limited. And so this is true, I think, for any religious culture is when the rules become more important than the point, which is people thriving, growing into people capable of loving and being loved, you have to push against the rules because we like safety. We like security. So where we go wrong is we make the the rules the most important thing and demand that everybody yield to them. And there's an inherent tension between freedom and structure. You see it even in politically. Conservatism is what's the structure, the traditions. We need it. We want to feel secure. We don't want to just say, oh, every new idea is a good idea. That's not a great way to go. But on the other hand, we need to be liberal. We need to be willing to adapt, to change, to grow. There's always a tension in every human being, in every political structure, in every faith. But when we get out of balance, it either becomes off the rails because there's not enough structure or dead because there's too much structure. And so we have to look at what am I actually doing and reinforcing through my choices? Do I need to be more cautious or do I need to challenge some of the structure for me to live more authentically. But the kind of short version of it is, is my fear driving me all the time? Or is my honesty and my courage driving me? Fear and, of punishment, you mean? Fear yeah, of God? Fear of loss of the community. Or, yeah. Or fear of doing the wrong thing, maybe. Yeah. Fear of loss of the community. I mean, not I even, for, I would say not even fear of loss of the community, fear of what if I'm yes. going against God and, yes, and it's wrong. That's right. I, exactly. I think I had all those fears initially. Like I don't want 
to disappoint people, but I also, I don't want to be wrong. I don't want my own hubris or my own thinking to lead me astray. So there was a lot of caution for me anyway, at first, like I was, I thought about things for a long time before I chose differently because I was trying to make sure that I wasn't just being rebellious. Arrogant. Yeah. Rebellious. Exactly. Yeah, so right. I was from low. doing it out of knowledge and not out of just rejection. Exactly. And so there was a certain point at which I realized that I was holding back more out of fear of rejection than a sense that God, I was clear that God was actually okay with me, but I still cared about the social consequences. So I still held back, but that was more about fear of how people would see me rather than fear of what I really felt was true. And that yes. was more when I started to speak more honestly. And what happened? Did your family accept it? When you moved hmm. to Vermont, isn't that also a statement? Because you're not really allowed to leave. No, that's not true. In fact, there's Mormons all over the world. Okay. No, there was no problem with that in terms okay. of, okay. of the religion. Okay. My, my dad moved back there because it was a good job and they, they were fundamental to creating more of a community there. So they helped build the actual church that we met in. We had meetings in our home for a little while when I was a little girl because there aren't many Latter-day Saints in Vermont. Okay. So no, there wasn't any problem in terms okay. of the religion. Okay. But I also was fortunate of for having, I had parents that were very invested in the faith. And so I was also as a little girl, because that was just how we did things. They didn't worry too much about having dissenting thought. So I could have dissenting thought about things without anybody getting too upset. So it, I didn't feel fortunately from my family. I knew that I could be who I was. And you felt and, safe. Yeah. Exploring. And be accepted. I felt like my parents didn't need me to think the same way for them mm -hmm. to be okay with me. And that's a big deal because a lot of people do not have that in their families. So I was more concerned. I didn't want to disappoint my parents for sure. Mm -hmm. I didn't want for what they gave to me for me to just toss it away because I cared about them and I cared about what they'd given me and I didn't want to be flippant about it. But I didn't fear that I would be rejected. The larger question for me was my larger community I care about and I want to belong here and maybe I'll be seen as a problem. I was a little bit, but- At the beginning you got pushback. Yeah, back. I got more pushback. But I think I've also created like you your said, own community. I think that's right? true. I'm not just trying to destroy something. I'm trying right, to right. facilitate something good within right, us growing. Right. And I think a lot of people can feel that. And so right. they're more willing to listen because they are trying to solve something and they don't want to destroy what's been a good thing in their life, but they may want it to evolve or they may want it to transform in positive ways. And I think if they have seen that I can facilitate some of that, or I have thoughts about how that may happen, they're more open to it. I recently was speaking to a client and she's Orthodox, very Orthodox. And she was talking about a sexual issue mm. that she was having with her husband. And I said, did you discuss it with him? She said, what's the point? There's nothing to do about it. I mm. said, what do you mean? A lot of times I wasn't mm. aware that I can bring up these very frustrating mm. conversations that are painful. Maybe there isn't anything to do about it within the faith and following the rules. But do they know that they don't know that they're allowed? Are they yeah. aware? And there's this exactly. sadness of being trapped. Like you said it before, yes. like they're trapped and, yeah. and there's nowhere to go That's because right. they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And the rock is, I don't like this. It's something is wrong or something doesn't feel right. And I don't want to throw all religion, away, but, but this doesn't feel right to me. That's and right. the same hand, I don't want to go against religion and God. So what do right. we do? But there's not enough of that place that we can discuss it and comfort. It's starting to become a little bit more safe, but still there's no acceptance. Of, yes. And if I choose differently, is it a hard place or is it okay? Is there something that's preventing you from achieving your goals or interfering with your happiness? Maybe it's anxiety or stress. BetterHelp.com will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online with a broad range of expertise available depending on what you need and the services available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send messages to your counselor. BetterHelp.com is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches that make it easy and free to change your counselors if you need to. And it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp.com wants you to start living a happier life today. So visit BetterHelp.com slash hope to recharge. That's BetterHelp dot com slash hope to recharge and join over a million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. You'll also get 10% off your first month. Once again, that's betterhelp.com slash hope to recharge.
Yeah, exactly. I, and I think you're spot on when you're talking about that, when you're just living it and you have no sense of a choice because these are the rules. This is what I must do. Why would I even talk about it? What's the point? That sense of entrapment, depression, death, psychological death is real. And the people that are often coming to me and you, I imagine, are people that are, they feel stuck. They're looking for, I can't figure this out. And what the work of good coaching is or good therapy is helping people to move from just being and living something out to being more able to reflect on it, to see it as, okay, this is the system I'm operating in. This is how I've learned what it is to be who I am. This is what's going on in my marriage. Because if you can move from like subject to object in the sense that you're moving from just living it to being able to think back on it or look at it, you increase your choices. Right. Now, it doesn't mean your choices are easy or don't take courage, or you might even still say, I'm not going to shake up this marriage. I'm not going to bring this up. Even then, you're still doing it from a different position. You're doing it more from a self-aware position and saying, this is what I can live with. This is what I think is the best given the consequences or choices. But there's still more psychological freedom in it because it's not just happening to you. Right. You're more of a chooser in it. And whenever right. we move from, right. from being victim. acted upon, exactly, to actor, yeah. we get happier. That's what my dissertation yeah. was on right. sexual agency. Who are the women that are sexual actors in their lives mm. versus just living out a script that they feel they must live, subjugated to a man's sexuality psychologically? Versus women who are choosing deliberately how they're going to live out their sexuality. That's so much a part of my work is increasing people's agency through moving them from a place of enmeshment in a system to a place of self-awareness to increase their choices and their choosing ability. Do you think it's important to marry someone in the same faith or the same mindset of faith of God and path of religion? Well, that's maybe too simple for me to say one way or the other, but I would say there's certainly advantages to it. Then there's potentially disadvantages to it. I married somebody who's a Latter-day Saint. I love that because we understand important cultural and theological references. We have a shared understanding, a shared family system. All that's wonderful. But I also married someone who had similar doubts and questions as I did, and we could understand that as well, both the desire to belong and an awareness of the immature and some right. of the tensions. And so that allowed for, but I again married at 30. If I'd married at 21 or something, you never know what you're going to get because I was more able to choose someone that I really felt I could have meaningful engagement around yeah. that fundamental tension. So I'm grateful for that. But I think that you know, I have friends who've married outside of the faith and there's advantages to that as well. And inherent tensions around my spouse doesn't necessarily value this mm -hmm. tradition or this idea or this belief. And so it's harder when you have children because you're trying to find a way to give them the best in who you are. And it can be difficult if your partner doesn't share some of those ideas. I just interviewed one of my mentors. Her son died from suicide. She's a convert. Mm. She converted to Judaism when she was 16. I just spoke about that aspect of what mm. is it like to recover after death by suicide mm. as a parent. She became very Orthodox and they started a Jewish Orthodox family. And then her husband left the faith. She was very right. She's a public speaker in the Jewish Orthodox world. And mm. her husband became an agnostic. And I said, how mm. is that? First of all, it's very taboo in our communities. Very sure. taboo. We did a whole episode on true marriages, love, respect, and trust. Yeah. And maybe when we marry somebody in the same faith, it keeps us safe. But do we yeah. really lead with love, respect, and trust? Because that's true intimacy and that's right. true marriage. So right. we're confining ourselves to comfort of, oh, Absolutely. we know this, but do, but love. Exactly. Respect. It's a very good point. A lot of us get married because we want reinforcement, not intimacy. So we go find someone who, and I think this is a crisis that a lot of people that I work with are having, which is we got married on the basis of a shared ideology, Belief. shared right. And that actually gave us shelter from knowing each other or right. knowing ourselves even because we could just live out the pattern and do what the community says we should do and tell ourselves we're good. And so what happens when there's a faith crisis or faith transition within that is that it brings all that to the fore and kind of pressures the couple to deal with who are we? Am I believing this just because I get reinforcement from the group or is this really me? Am I rebelling against this just because I'm angry or is this really me to reject this? So it pushes the question of who am I and who are we? And that's often very uncomfortable and a process many of us want to avoid. So a lot of us start invoking God to get on our side <laughs> rather than actually dealing with who is this person I've chosen and what am I going to do about him or her and my love for them? 
But yes, to her point, which is, I think if you're really going to live up to the best in your theology, it's going to facilitate you loving, caring for, and respecting another human being, even if they think differently than you. That's really the pinnacle of faith is that you can love others. You can be loved. You can respect the differences. You can tolerate that in this complex reality of living life, that you may come up with different ways of thinking or being. The larger question is not how orthodox are you to my version of reality? Or my comfort or my comfort. What makes me comfortable, exactly. Or what I want you to think versus can I accept and respect another person in an honest process, if that's what it is, and make room for them because they're going to have truth that I do not have. And that's really a thriving marriage. Exactly. I think it's the hard work. Yes, to, exactly. but it's very hard because they say marry the same culture, the ma- the same language, the same religion, because men and women, as it is, it's the difficult. It's just hard to understand each other. So yeah, let's reduce the stresses and just make it simple because marriage is constant sure. work. So let's find less work. Sure. But we're missing out on the core of yeah. intimacy and That's really right. accepting with not because because you believe like me, not because you show up like me, because I really love you for who you are. and I love and respect you. And I choose you for that more than your connection to God and religion. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And when I've worked with couples who've gone through where one has a faith crisis or stops Mm -hmm. believing, when the couple does that from the best in themselves, they both get wiser. They become more intimate friends. They become more able to bring the best in their thinking to their children because they shape each other. There becomes more of what really matters in life because they're each to that sort of Chinese metaphor of each touching different parts of the elephant. I'm, I'm probably not doing justice to that metaphor. But to not have so much hubris to think just because I know this part of the elephant, I'm right. But on the other hand, it's a legitimate perspective. There's something here to be understood. And what is the best in what I think without saying I get the whole creature? Yeah, Uh, we're just limited. So what can I learn from another person's perspective, experience, point of view? That's really the best in caring about other people to allow them to inform how we think. That's what will drive us to be wiser and more capable of loving and accepting ourselves and others. And remove the fear factor. Exactly. And really show up because I care, because I love you, because I I accept you. And I want you part of my life, but not only if you follow my comfort zone of my relationship with God. And there's a lot of do's and don'ts. I know in my own personal marriage, I got married also late compared to my community. I wasn't a marriage seeker. Like I Mm -hmm. saw a lot of things that I didn't like, but I didn't know how to pinpoint it. Yeah. Even though my parents had a lovely marriage, but I saw so many others and so many women looked sad. So many just looked sad and oppressed and were like a robot going through life. I didn't know how to change it, but I also knew that I didn't want that. Yes. And I'm like, that's not an attractive life for me at all. I don't want that. I was 26 when I got married and I married a more open-minded, quote unquote, modern, not the Mm -hmm. ultra Orthodox that I grew up in. We moved to America, but we did have certain beliefs, but I was exploring much more. He grew up more modern. I grew up more to the right. And we were both going to the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Then we crossed paths. And I was more, uh, let's go more liberal. And he's like, no, let's go more orthodox. Mm, And I'm like, no, I'm not going back to my trauma. I'm going away from my trauma. And there was a lot of conflict there. And we kept on bringing God into it. And I'm like, but it's not about God. It's about me, my feelings, my emotions, how I feel. And I kept on saying, I don't think God enjoys the way I'm feeling right now. There's no way that God is enjoying the way I'm feeling. I don't know if you know this, and I want Mm. your point of view. Maybe it's a whole other conversation. When the Orthodox world, when a woman has her menstrual cycle, Mm. so the husband and wife separate physically. Mm. the orthodox world the ultra orthodox world and after her menstrual cycle she needs to have at least five days of menstruation and then seven days of clean she has to Mm. count seven days of clean and then she goes to the pure water which is called the mikvah she dunks once or three times whatever sometimes Mm -hmm. seven and then she's pure and then they can be together again that separation for me was brutal brutal Mm, brutal i just felt abandonment every single time yeah and i just felt it was wrong like we don't have to have sex but i want to hug i just even after, after birth it could be five to ten weeks sometimes three months no touch, no, no connection. Yeah. Separate beds. Some people are more or less strict. Okay, fine. Yeah. The bottom line is, and I used to, every time I went to the pure water, I used to say, I'm doing this for you, not for me. Mm. I want you to thank me because I'm doing this for you, not for me. I know that Mm. you believe in this. For me, it's hard. It's hell every time I Mm. go. And I used to feel resentful to God and to him. Like I'm going, Mm. I don't want to do this, but I'm taking my body to a place that I don't want to be. Yeah. I went through earlier a very unfailure and I stopped having my menstrual cycle. And I think it was God's gift to me. 
I'm literally God's gift to me. And my husband said, I'm sorry that I didn't understand. And I was so living Rigid. a fear of what yeah. is right or wrong. He said, I wish I was able to remove fear and see more yeah. of your pain. Yeah. Good for him. But it took years and years and he yeah. still doesn't know what would be the right thing to do. But there's so much, but that's what God wants. That's what the Torah says. That's the Bible. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? You, you right. have to right. go. And right. what do you want me to do? I won't be able to touch you. Then you're in service right. versus in belonging. That's right. Yeah. First of all, good for him for just being able to see it more, to see how much fear was driving him. But yes, when you're in that and you're like, wait, I don't want to betray God. Like my wife's having a hard time with it, but maybe that's just because she's weak, but I don't want to like just capitulate to weakness. You can understand yes. why somebody would get stuck in that. I see a lot of that also in the people I work with where they love their wife and, but they don't want to break the rules. And so they're like, oh, but what really has happened in a sense is the marriages between themselves and their view of God or the community's view of God, not the marriage between the man and the woman. So that how is, do we switch that around? I think we need more cultural teaching and ideas about what really constitutes marriage. Is it just loyalty to the system? You are actors to reproduce the system, right? Men, you do this, women, you do that. Or are we striving for something more intimate, more about love, respect, and honesty. And so again, the more people just are living out the one model they know, it's much harder to challenge it because there is no other model. This just makes us bad if you don't like the mikvah ritual rather than wait, is this actually achieving what we want? Maybe we would be more godly to actually love and be loved to choose more deliberately how we relate to these cultural pieces, to these rituals. But you can't even do that if you don't have an alternative. And a lot of the work I'm doing in my community is helping people to see more clearly what they're choosing and what the implications of their choices are, not because they need to do it my way, but because it allows them to be more uh, agentic, to actually be choosers in a more right. deliberate way and understand the consequences of their choosing, which yeah. is ultimately the most human thing about us is that we must choose and we must live with the consequences of our choices. So the more we are aware of what we're doing, the better we will choose. Um, and so it's helping people to see by giving them an alternative. That's why I'm very grateful that I grew up in Vermont and a bicultural experience because it helped me see better. Yeah. Even though it was sometimes stressful. Yeah. yeah. So where can people take your courses, find you? You also have retreats that you have. You just came yeah. back. Where were you in Europe? We somewhere? were in Europe for a couple of weeks. Yeah. We did a couple's retreat from Northern Italy up to Paris. And oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Those Whoever just, comes out of your retreats, if it feels like they were reborn, literally yeah. reborn. The voices yeah. are like, wow, we got another chance in life because the yeah. life before was not fun. And now we're reborn. Yeah. We're alive. Yeah, it's true. It's a, it's an incredible experience because because you put the kids aside, work demands, and you go and you immerse yourself in the question of who you are as a couple. And of course, I'm there to give you a way of understanding what you've been doing and what's been getting you stuck and unhappy and what you could do differently. And so through that process of seeing, seeing yourself, seeing your partner, doing these sort of self-reflective exercise, getting my input, well, then couples are able to see how they've been in this stuck place and what they might be able to do that's loving, more courageous, more honest, what they do to create actual friendship and intimacy. And so that can be a very powerful, especially the retreat, because it's so immersive, can be this kind of transition point. I've had people say, we define our marriage in terms of pre-retreat and post. People can find me on my website, which is just my name, finlayson-fife.com. And on my website, there is my podcast, which is just conversations like this. There is a podcast called Room for Two, which is me doing couples coaching around intimacy issues, around sexuality, emotional. I'm helping couples. And so they get to see a lot of my concepts applied in that sort of one-on-one -on -one work. And in the room. Find, yeah, find that very helpful because they're like, oh, that's like me. We do that yes. and so on. Yeah. And then I have my online courses that are the art of desire, which is about women's sexuality and self-development, the art of loving, which is men's sexuality and men's self-development, and then two couples courses, which is strengthening your relationship, which is really helping people see what's going on in their relationship, how they're playing out different roles and different sort of reactive patterns that keep them stuck, and then an enhancing sexual intimacy, couples sexuality course. My primary reference point is working with Latter-day Saints, but these are much like this conversation or other conversations you'll hear me in. I'm not promoting LDS theology, but I'm understanding people's framing, which has similarities, of course, across different 
orthodox or more structured religious communities because of that tension between belonging, between the rules and what it is to thrive within those rules or how to transcend some of that into a deeper, more internalized morality and be more capable of intimate connection. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Do you think people should take the course before they get married or they have to go through life first to understand the beauty of the course? If it were me, I would take as a woman, the art of desire course or a man, the art of loving course, because I think that at least helps you better understand your own sexuality mm -hmm. and some of the vulnerabilities. The couples courses would probably be better once you are married and you're seeing some of the stuck places or patterns. Um, we also are going to develop a newlywed course for people, especially that have not been sexual prior to marriage. So that that is like what to expect around sexuality, but also what to expect around shifts in the emotional relationship as a preparation so that they can normalize what's happening rather than we're fundamentally broken. Yeah. And we have it a lot also in yeah. the Orthodox community, a lot of that. Yeah. That's absolutely. why sex therapists in the Orthodox community have a waiting list. Yes, exactly. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Dr. Jennifer, thank you so much. This was lovely. I want to come to one of your retreats. I, I, oh, it just sounds yeah. so fascinating and so yeah. inspiring and, yeah. and it's just so refreshing, just refreshing. Yeah. And I would love to experience it. Yeah. So it would be lovely to have you If there. it's not on a weekend on a Shabbat, I will try to do it with you. Oh yeah. That's because Saturday it would not work so well. Let's just keep that in mind. Yeah. I do these shorter ones that are Thursday, Friday, the one in the fall it was, uh, goes till Saturday, but yeah. anyway, we can figure yeah. that out. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you very good. much. You're so welcome. I check her podcast out because when you're in the car, just listen to her voice. It's just so calming. And forget about the whole idea of specific Mormon. It doesn't matter because we're all beings and we have right. the same sexuality and the same desire. It's it, like different it, languages. We're doing it in a different language. Yeah. The same and, and there's so question. much wisdom in these conversations, especially your new series with the couples. It's so powerful. And I think a lot of the Orthodox world can gain from it. So Check right. it out. Links will be in the show notes. Thanks for joining us. Bye till next time. Thank you for listening till the end. We highly appreciate all of our listeners. In Mental Health Together is better. You being here means a tremendous amount to us. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like some extra boost of information and inspiration that is not on the podcast, you can go to our website, hopetorecharge.com. There's some premium content that for the cost of a cup of coffee, you can download some amazing information that will help you, a tool that will guide you through life. So so don't skip a beat. Don't hesitate. Go to hopetorecharge.com and see what other offerings we have there for your mental health well-being. Thank you for joining us. And remember, if you enjoyed this and you want to say thank you, the best way of gratitude will be by you leaving a review or a comment or sharing this with a loved one. There is no greater form of gratitude for us. Thank you. Bye till next time. Looking to reduce your anxiety and stress, relax your muscles, or get a better night's sleep? Check out Maxifies.com, 100% legal hemp, where you can find doctor-formulated, lab-certified, high-quality CBD oils, tinctures, and other items, cultivated, grown, harvested, and packaged in the United States, and available in different sizes and strength formulas. Check out Maxifies.com, that's M-A-X-I-F-Y-Z.com, and use coupon code HOPE to get 10% off your order, plus free shipping. That's Maxifies.com.